there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the mantas of the Andaman Sea and how citizen science has been really critical in supporting this work. And it'll give you a little bit more information on how if any of you guys are divers, you can get more involved in this research. Um, but not just this research, really any research on mantas anywhere in the world um, and a few other species as well, which will be covered in some future talks that we're doing. Um, so first to just introduce myself a little bit more, um, Anna. I am a member of the research team with the Marine Megafauna Foundation. So we are an organization that focuses on studying large marine animals like mantas and whale sharks, as Janae already explained, and then using that research to uh, really advocate for effective conservation impacts um, or interventions and working to educate people on it as well. Uh, so I have been based here in Mozambique for the last five and a half years, and I just did um, fourth or fifth season since 2016, fifth season, I think, um, uh, in Thailand. So I actually just got back a few weeks ago from that. So I head over there for a couple of weeks every year looking for the mantas specifically. Um, so this year, I'm really glad that I got a little bit of it in before the season came to a bit of an abrupt end. So just want to back up a little bit and talk about how I got into this manta research and um, specifically why I've been so interested in Thailand and Myanmar. Um, so I don't know if you guys have been watching any of the other talks that we've been doing so far, uh, but you'll see that I followed a similar path to Jess and Ellie. Um, I actually used to work as a dive instructor and I was working in Thailand when I had my first experience with a giant manta. Um, this is from that trip and this is also pretty much what my manta photos back then used to look like. Um, and some of this is because the camera I was using back then, but also um, it's different from the photos I'm usually taking right now because I wasn't really thinking about these mantas as a researcher. Um, I was just thinking, oh my gosh, they're cool, they're big, um, that's exciting, and I take photos like this. Um, and then occasionally I'd get a photo a little bit more like this, um, which is the photo that kind of excites me these days. Because with the research that we do with MMF, one of the big ways we study mantas is by looking at the patterns on their bellies. So we use these spots. So you can kind of see uh, in this photo a little bit right here. Um, we use those spots to identify the mantas individually. Um, but back then, I didn't know that, um, and so I wasn't taking those photos, which is something I kick myself about now, because when I looked back at this dive trip, and I was going through my old photos, because now that I study these mantas, I want to know which mantas I was seeing, um, I only really found one photo with a usable ID, and that was this one. Um, and I will talk about this manta a little bit more later. Um, but it's definitely something I kick myself over now because I just could know so much more about them um, than I do. These days, um, I am taking photos of the manta's bellies and telling lots of people like you about it as well um, so that we can learn more about them. Uh, the reason that we're taking photos of manta's bellies, um, if you look at this manta here, you can see their spots and every manta has a unique spot pattern on their belly, a bit like a fingerprint there. So we take photos of these um, and then we can use them to individually identify that manta. Um, and then we can use that for all sorts of different kinds of research. We can do things like figure out the population size and structure, how many males, females, if they're adults, if they're juveniles. We can see how that population changes over time, if it's growing, if it's decreasing, and just keep tabs on how it's doing. We can see about movement patterns, because if we photograph a manta in one place and then photograph them later on in another, we know they've gone between those two spots. Um, and then there's a ton of other research you can do um, looking at how the mantas are aging, because we are tracking them over sometimes very long periods of time. Um, predation, because you can see different types of scars on them. You can observe reproduction um, as well. 
So there's a ton you can do with photos. And the great thing about photos is you don't need to be a scientist to take a photo of a mantis belly. You just need a camera. Um, and then you can take a photo. And we can learn a lot more about that. Um, so it's something that we really try and get lots of divers knowing about so they can support our research with this. Um, there are some advantages to having researchers out there because there are certain types of statistical analyses that we can only do if we also count the days and the conditions and what things we're doing when we don't see mantas as well. Um, but getting lots of photos from divers can hugely supplement our research. So when we started looking at these mantas out in Thailand, when you start looking at new populations of mantas or any animal anywhere in the world, generally your first question is going to be, how many are there? You want to count them. Um, you want to know how many are in the area. And I find this particularly interesting because back in 2010, the first time I saw all of those mantas out at Koban, um, the dive instructor who was leading the trip, he was like, oh yeah, we just, we see these same 10 mantas, they hang out here all season. And me knowing really nothing about this back then, I was like, okay, seems reasonable. He knows what he's talking about. Um, but as time went on and I started actually studying them, I really found that it was quite a bit different from that. So when you actually start photographing them and accurately counting the mantas, you learn it's a little bit different. So Thailand doesn't have the biggest population in the world. Um, the largest giant manta populations that you'll see um, tend to be really in the Pacific. That's where they're seeing these huge populations. Um, there are over 2,000 mantas that have been identified in Ecuador. Um, so that's a spot where you can really see tons of them. But if you're looking over in the Indian Ocean, it is a big hot spot for them. So uh, here in Mozambique, we have a 17-year database. We've been studying these mantas over here since 2003, um, when my boss Andrea did her PhD over here. And we've had really consistent data collection since then. And we have identified in those 17 years, 294 giant mantas in Mozambique. And the thing is, that's kind of typical of the giant manta populations that you're seeing um, in the Indian Ocean. They tend to be quite small. Um, you see a lot more reef mantas over in this area. But what we found is Thailand is looking, Thailand, the Andaman Sea generally, is really looking like it has um, the largest population uh, in the Indian Ocean. And it's really blown my mind because going from, oh yeah, there's the same 10 mantas they're seeing all season discovered there's a lot more. Uh, we've already identified over 600 mantas in the area. And the thing is, we keep finding more and more mantas. Like, it's not slowing down at all. Um, we are not seeing the same ones over and over. We're seeing new mantas every single year. Um, and what that means is, like, you look at our discovery curve, you see how the sightings of new individuals are going up versus how many mantas we've seen in total, number of encounters, is it's really just heading up and it keeps going up and up and up and it doesn't show really signs of leveling off at this point. So we still are trying to figure out how many we're looking for there. Um, one thing I like to highlight here is if you're looking at the mantas that we have identified in this area, um, while well, the photos taken by me, by Andrea, Fabrice, other researchers, as well as uh, Rick, who is our coordinator over there, um, they actually are a relatively small portion of the total manta IDs that we have for the area, um, because we're only there for a small part of the year, other than Rick. Um, and I'm really relying pretty heavily on dive instructors and dive guides and professional photographers and videographers who take photos and send them in, but also tell divers that they go out with to send in their photos as well. Um, and it really means we've been able to identify a lot more mantas because of their support. So it's a hugely important part of the research over there, especially because it's not a year-round base for us and there are so many divers in the water there that we really can use all of their support. Um, and it's really easy to do. 
Um, so anyone who wants to support the research, uh, you just go to the website mantamatcher.org. It is the global online database for manta rays. So it was co-created by MMF uh, with Wild Me. Um, and Wild Me has set up a bunch of these websites to study a lot of different animals around the world, like whale sharks, uh, leopard sharks, and we're working on getting some other rays up there as well. Um, they also have some cetacean sites. So any animals that you can photo ID, um, we're working on having these big global online databases so we can support researchers all over the world and divers like you guys. Um, you don't need to keep track of a million different places to upload your photos. So for Thailand, this gets uploaded and I can use it in our research, but we're not the only organization using this, like Lamave in the Philippines and um, other organizations all over the world are welcome to join in um, and access this data. And we really hope it encourages collaborations. But how you do it, you go to the website, the homepage looks like this. Um, you see up here where it says report and encounter. You just need to click that and it takes you to a submission page like this. And there's only a couple of pieces of information we need. We need a photo of the manta's belly. Um, we can take video clips, photos are a little easier for us, but video clips work as well. Um, one photo, many photos, whatever you've got, we just need to be able to see those spots on the belly. And so you put the photos on here, you tell us what date, that you saw the manta on so we know when it was and then we also need to know where you were okay you don't need to know the gps coordinates if you have them great but you can also just give us a dive site name so for thailand if you say koban kota chai i know where those are um, so it's quite easy for us to keep track of and then we ask for your name and email it's not so we can spam you or anything it's just so that you can get updates on the manta that you saw. So you can get an email that tells you when the manta has been matched and you can see which manta it was and where it's been in the past. And then you'll also get manta email updates in the future. So when somebody else sees your manta and photographs it, you'll get an update that someone else has seen it. Uh, you have the option, you can click this little menu here if you wanna fill in more information on coloration, sex, estimated size, and so forth. Um, but again, those are just bonus bits of information for us. Um, just the photo, a date, and a place, it should take you 30 seconds to do, and um, it's very helpful for our data. So once your photo gets submitted, this is what the side for a researcher looks like. Um, this is just an example I just did last night to show you what it looks like. So I go in, I see there's a photo in there, and you can see it is a lovely ID photo. Um, this is one that was actually submitted a while back by um, one of the really great photographers in the area, Rich Carey, who's been hugely supportive of our work there. Um, so I go in and I crop it to just select the area that we're matching from, okay, which is just that center area of the manta. And then there is an algorithm. Um, it's a bit like facial recognition or fingerprint matching, but for manta bellies. Um, and I run a scan and you'll see it's pretty quick. Um, when you've got good photos, it'll match quite easily. You can see it's given me 191 potential matches. And the first two photos up there, um, so the photos on the right are my photo, the other photos on the left are other mantas in the database, and it ranks them based off similarity. So if you have a match, it tends to be the first one. So this one, you see it had two matches right up there at the top, so quite quick. Um, I've added it to this manta, and then we can just take a quick look at this manta. She's one that's been seen um, several times in Thailand. Her name is Ultron. Um, I saw her, Rich has seen her. Um, and she has just spent a lot of time hanging around Koh Cha Chai and Koh Ban back in 2016. Um, she just spent a few weeks there, so I went a little bit fast. You can't quite see in this video here, but um, she was seen at Koh Cha Chai, seen at Koh Ban. She moved back and forth. 
They're two sites just a couple of kilometers from each other. Um, and this is pretty common. The fact that we haven't seen her since 2016 doesn't worry me so much um, because with a lot of the giants, it's very common. They show up, they spend a few weeks out in the area, and then they disappear again for years often. Um, but we're seeing the mantas with a pretty clear seasonality. Um, so this is the weeks of the year and the number of encounters. Um, so they'll start popping up around late November, December, and we get really the peak happens February to April tends to be the prime time for them. Um, the thing is, though, it's not quite so consistent with the giants, unfortunately, which is what makes our research frustrating and exciting um, because we are studying giant mantas. Uh, there are two species of mantas in the world. The giants are the larger of the two species. Um, they're the ones that grow up to about eight meters across. And uh, they also seem to have quite a different lifestyle from the smaller reef mantas. Um, reef mantas are still pretty big, up to about five meters. But unlike the reef mantas, we think that they're spending most of their time more out in the open ocean, whereas the reef mantas, they tend to be a bit more resident to a coastal section of reef. Um, they will still swim hundreds of kilometers um, in pretty short periods of time, but they definitely hang out in the same area a lot more, which is why um, I've had a lot of really frustrating seasons where we go out and even within a couple of days, um, things can really change out here. Um, it can be really high risk, high reward diving. Uh, we had a season a few years ago where um, Andrea did an ex uh, expedition um, just a week before me and they came back and they're like, oh, it was amazing. We ID'd 53 mantas in three days. And so we were like, yeah, it's on. Like, we're going to have a great trip. We're going to see so many mantas, get tons of research done. And then we showed up and there were no mantas. And so it's just like over a couple of days. They're incredibly unpredictable. They move around a lot more. And it's just, they're a lot um, less reliable for sightings. Um, it can be much less consistent than you get with the reef mantas. Um, but that is what makes it exciting. Um, we're also on these ex expeditions um, working to do a little bit more exploration on some of them um, because some of these sites are really not well known. So I've been saying Thailand, 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 but it's actually not the only place we're working. Um, this map is showing some of our main study areas here um, and our main manta sites. So on the Thailand side, Hindang Hinwang um, off of Koh Lanta is a really great spot for mantas. Um, then I'm focusing a lot of the research that we do up in the Similans around Koh Ban and Koh Cha Chai. Um, so this is Thailand side. And then we head up to Myanmar and there's this spot Black Rock, which is great for mantas. Um, but the thing is Myanmar has been very closed for many years and it's a lot more difficult to get up there. And so while there are hundreds of dive boats, down here in Thailand. Um, you head up to the Myanmar side and there's not very many boats making the trip. And Black Rock's quite the trek out for most of the boats and that tends to be where they stop. But the thing is Black Rock is part of something called the Mick Archipelago, which stretches right down here all the way up to here. It's about 400 kilometers. Um, and one of the things that we did a few years ago is we took this trip and we decided to just head north and do some exploration diving north of Black Rock because no one goes diving up there. It's just a little bit too far and a lot of trips don't want to risk kind of jumping in and seeing nothing. But we're like, let's go see. And if we see nothing, then we'll still have an adventure. Um, and so we went up there and we actually did find um, a site that we thought looked promising for mantas. Um, it was this area called, this island called West Canister, and we're like, oh, it looks really great. And we actually have had a confirmed mantis sighting there, which is fantastic for just a couple of dives out there. Um, it's, we've not had any like big sightings. It was just a, quite a quick sighting, but for just having done a handful of dives up there and knowing how Black Rock 
can be absolutely incredible, but then you can go do three days of diving there and see zero mantas. But if you just hit it on the wrong day, they're not there. Um, we think it's really worth doing more exploration up here, especially because, yeah, the mantas are moving and we think there's definitely potential for more spots up there. Um, beyond that, as I mentioned, these giant mantas, we think they're a bit more of a pelagic species than the reef mantas. So we think they might be spending all this time when they disappear for four years and we don't see them. Um, they might be spending it more out here in the open ocean, or maybe they're moving out across to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Um, and that's something we've really wanted to explore more. Um, that was actually one of the goals for this year is um, exploring at the Andaman Islands. Andrea, on her, her expedition, she was going to do our first ever trip out there. Um, but then um, 2020 happened and her trip was cancelled. So we haven't been able to do that. We're hoping maybe next year, um, but it's definitely in our plans for the future uh, because we think that the population of mantas we're seeing here is definitely going to be using that area as well. We know they get mantas there, we just are not sure if it's the same mantas or if they're different mantas. Um, to put this in a bit of perspective, um, this is from Black Rock to Narkadam. Narkadam, I'm going to say that totally wrong. Um, it's about 400 kilometers, which is a very swimmable distance for a giant manta. Uh, we've got tagging data that shows them going over a thousand kilometers in under 60 days, so it's very doable for these mantas. So just to show you some of the hot spots, um, we have a couple of areas where we're seeing the most mantas. Um, we've had over 300 encounters um, with identified mantas at Coban. Second place is Black Rock, where we have 250 um, mantas that have been identified, not 250 mantas, 250 encounters with mantas there, um, where we've gotten photo IDs of them. And I think that Black Rock, it's just, it's not dived by a ton of people, not a ton of people taking photos there, um, nothing like the scale of what we're getting in Thailand. So the fact that we've already got 250 encounters from there means that if we get more diving or just more photos for more divers up there, um, I think it's uh, quite the hot spot. Then uh, we've got some more spots down in the south, Hindang, Hinwang, um, are quite popular with over 140 manta encounters. Koh Ta Chai is also quite good in the Simulans with over 80. And then in our little exploratory sites, um, we have one from West Canister and one from Narkandam. Um, but the thing is, like I just want to highlight, just because we have one doesn't mean that we're not like there aren't gonna be more mantas up there. It's just because the effort in that area has been very low, um, just because we don't have people diving and sending in photos from there. But that is something we're looking to remedy in the future. We're also looking to try some additional methods um, more than just the photo ID. Photo ID is great, but again, we're limited by having divers in those areas. So if you don't have divers there, um, how are you going to study the mantas? We want to learn more about the mantas, what they're doing um, when we're not there, um, as well as when they're heading out to these different areas. Like if they're out in the middle of the Andaman Sea where nobody's diving, we need to use something other than photos to study them. So some of the common methodologies that are used elsewhere in the world, and we, in collaboration with Fauna and Flora International in Myanmar, are starting to do a little bit more up there is use things like tissue sampling so we can do some genetic studies of the mantas in the area and also tagging because if we're going to tag mantas with satellite tags these are videos of tagging um, you're just putting a little bit of a dart under the mantis skin it's like a little mosquito bite for a manta this size. You can see this is a pretty typical giant manta reaction, which is not much of a reaction at all. Um, so you put those tags in and they can give you a lot more information about depth, about temperature, um, about light, so you can get latitudes and see more about where they're moving. 
Um, so it can be a really important supplement to the photo ID that we have been doing there for the last couple of years. And yeah, it's something that we're really going to be doing a lot more of in the future. Um, unfortunately, the last couple seasons where we've started working with FFI, um, of course, nature hasn't cooperated. I've had uh, one of their scientists who keeps coming on trips with me trying to um, see mantas so I can teach him how to do some of this stuff. Um, and unfortunately, the mantas don't cooperate great when he's there with me. Um, this is what a tissue biopsy looks like in this video right now. It's a bit less than a gram of muscle tissue um, and with that you can use it to do genetic analysis. You can also do some other uh, types of chemical analyses called stable isotope and fatty acid analysis which tells you more about um, trophic levels and what these animals are eating. So uh, another thing that I've noticed a lot of with the mantas that we're studying there is anthropogenic scarring. And um, anthropogenic scarring, this is just human-caused scars. So things like net and lines, um, this is a particularly egregious example. Um, one of the mantas I've seen up in Myanmar with just this absurd amount of rope dragging off the back of her. Um, and about 30% of the mantas that we're seeing there show evidence of anthropogenic scarring. And that is a lower range estimate, I'd say. So at least one in three. Um, I think it's a low estimate because oftentimes I'm using other people's photos, which might just show limited angles or might not be great quality. So there could be scars there that I'm just not seeing as well. So we're seeing things, everything from rope that's attached to the manta, nets that are still attached to the manta, to other things that are clear evidence of line scars. Um, this scar here, um, a bit of fishing line trailing off that manta can do a cut, um, a kind of a clean cut like that through it. And luckily it came off, otherwise it could even eventually, if it's left on there long enough, completely amputate that fin and that manta is not gonna really get anywhere after that happens. Oops. Ah, no, sorry, my presentation's up here. Um, I was just adding in a new slide. Let me just, sorry guys, I'm gonna quickly fix this so you can actually see what I'm talking about. Oh no, I deleted something, sorry. Let's go back. Okay, um, so this is Hornbill, the manta. Um, she is one of our Thailand mantas. Um, and one of the things you'll notice first about her when you see her is that she is missing um, both of those front cephalic fins, those head or face fins that mantas have. Um, and these kind of full amputations usually um, we presume they're caused by entanglement and fishing gear because um, that's the most common way this is going to tend to happen. Um, she seems to be doing all right without it. She's definitely going to be having some trouble feeding. Um, most mantas will lose one cephalic fin. It's more uncommon to see them missing both of them. Um, but the thing is we actually didn't name her hornbill because of her um, slightly strange looking face there. Um, it's actually because if you look at her belly pattern there, um, you can see she's got this pattern that looks a bit like a hornbill the bird on her. So that is actually how she got the name. Um, she's had quite a tough life you can see here as well. She has evidence of um, a shark encounter at some point in the past. So she's definitely um, been through a lot, but she's still going. and. The cool thing about her is that she actually is our longest recite for all of the Thailand mantas. So I saw her in March 2016 and about a year later um, I had a bunch of new photos start getting submitted um, that were all coming from this uh, professional videographer who decided to go through his archive and send me all of his old photos. And that was great because we started getting all of these older submissions that we could match back to our modern database. So um, a bit like I did when I came to work for MMF and I looked at 
all of my really old Manta photos. And I was like, are there any IDs in here? He did the same and he got quite a bit out of it because he'd been working in Thailand and Myanmar for a while. And one of the photos was this old photo that we matched back to Hornbill. It's a bit hard to tell in this photo because um, it's a bit grainy and I'm sure the screen is not helping things. But that's Hornbill. Um, she's got the shark bite. It's kind of gotten stretched out a bit in the intervening years. And you'll notice she still had her cephalic fins back then. Um, but that was March 2004. So she has 12 years between sightings. So that's the longest we've got for any of our Thailand mantas. Then I promised I'd get back to this manta. So that was the one manta I managed to find um, from that old encounter that had a decent ID photo. So I added her to the database a couple of years ago. Um, and I was pretty pleased to see that she's actually been seen again in December 2013 and January 2014, um, both times down at Hindang. So she had moved from Koban up in the Similans down um, not quite 300 kilometers. It's about 215 straight line distance, um, although they go around Phuket, so it'd be a bit longer if you're not swimming through islands. Um, but yeah, so she was seen again a couple years later at a different spot. So that was really exciting for me um, that she's been seen again. Um, so that's um, my main Thailand manta summary. Um, for you guys, if any of you are divers or interested people, um, if you want to get involved and help us out with the research here or just for your own curiosity, which I strongly encourage because I think it's interesting, um, the best things for you guys to do is take ID photos. So go diving, look for mantas. And now you know what I didn't know 10 years ago, um, which is if you see a manta, um, try and get at least one of the belly and then we can tell you a little bit more about which manta you've seen. Um, but don't just take ID photos, tell your dive buddies, tell the groups that you go diving with. Um, so take those photos and then submit them to mantamatcher.org. Um, doesn't just have to be for Thailand, Myanmar, Andamans, if you go out there, that's the kind of place that, I mean, like I said, we're really, really looking to get more IDs from that area. Um, but submit them to Manta Matcher and also do it for other areas where we don't work because there are other Manta researchers who would love to see those photos. Um, you can also join us on an exhibition, ex I am determined to say exhibition this year, uh, expedition, join us on an expedition. We usually run at least uh, two every year, so you could join me or Andrea um, or in other parts of the world or other researchers um, and you can learn even more than I covered in this talk and you can go hopefully find some giant mantas with us and support our data collection. Um, and then as well, if you would like to adopt a manta, um, I tend to name a lot of the mantas here if I think of names, but if you have a great name you want to give the manta, um, you can adopt it through MMF and then um, you'll be able to name that manta. That's what we'll call the manta from here on out. And we'll also send you updates when we see these mantas again in the future. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for listening to me. Um, just of course as well, thank you to all of our collaborators and sponsors out in the Andaman Sea. We wouldn't be able to do it without the support um, of the guys off the chart expeditions. Um, they've been hugely supportive of us over the last 10 years. Um, and then, of course, Fauna and Flora International have been a great help for everything in Myanmar and permits and, yeah, trying to do a little bit more research and having some good contacts with the government up there. And, of course, all the other dive centers that have given us space on the boats so we can get out and do all of this. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop sharing now. And yeah. Ah, hey, Janae. Thanks so much for your presentation. Oh, it's good. Yeah. And, I forget uh, how strange these presentations feel <laughs> with the like, virtual oh, audience. Yeah. I think to myself. All those questions are like, has anyone seen a manta? Oh, you can't answer. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm used to more interaction and I have no facial. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, I'm just talking to myself. So hopefully, hopefully people were enjoying that. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, if anybody has questions for me about the research we've been doing. Yeah, guys, if you have questions, you can, again, open up that chat dialog box and type out everything you want to know. Um, usually in Tofu during the presentation, it's pretty casual and people like pop up and interrupt you with their questions. So it's a little bit more of a back and forth, but we'll dive in. I have a question for you, Manta, that's kind of a, man, I just called you Manta instead of Anna. <laughs> I have a question that was like recycled from one of our previous talks that one of our viewers had asked about the manta research going on specifically about like liver regeneration and do you know anything liver regeneration yeah because we were talking um with jessica about the florida mantas she has some great photos of how quickly they can heal from boats yeah. And then he kind of took it like a step even deeper into like organs. And I, I was thinking, like, well, I, I don't know anything about studying that. Are you here? I don't think I, he's here right now. He can, he can explain ah, this question much better. I I'm, don't think I'm going to be able to answer this one, but yeah, sure. Let's hear it. I'm curious at the time, but I've looked into it since and I can't really find anything, but essentially my question was, yeah. The liver is really known for its regenerative properties, so um, you can have pretty severe liver disease, and you can you know lose half of it, and then even after that, it can it can completely regenerate like nothing ever happened. And so once once I saw how regenerative um, mantis could be based off uh, the anthropogenic changes that were going on there, I was just curious if there was any like homologs maybe between um, the genes they have and the genes that we have in our liver that could explain how quickly they regenerate. Yeah, no, I, ooh, that is so far from my area of expertise. Okay. I actually, yeah, I don't know. And yeah, it's the kind of thing I'm not sure if there is anyone um, studying. I don't, like trying to think how you would, I mean, other than on a genetic scale, is yeah. that what you're thinking? Like, cause yeah. a practical experiment we wouldn't yeah. really be able to do. That's actually a question I was gonna ask you is if, if you knew if there, if there was any of like, online repository for data that uh, Manta gene expression profiles had been uploaded in? Um, um, so the one to chat with about all of that would be Steph, who I'm sure Janae, Janae has been speaking with her. She's another one of our researchers who just finished her PhD and she was focused on genetics. So she would be a much better person than me to ask all of these. Sure. So hopefully we'll be here soon. All right. No um, yeah, I, like there's some limited genetics i mean there's genetics research out there but it's not really addressing that question specifically so yeah let's see we got a question do you have mantas that migrate between mozambique and thailand ah yeah um hi mary thanks for that yeah that's a good question and no that's not actually a migration that we've seen mozambique and thailand seems to be a bit farther than we're seeing so uh when i had that map that was showing the andaman sea we think they'll kind of be in that kind of ocean basin um but not the whole indian ocean uh, indian ocean that's um farther than we've seen evidence for um have to check how many thousand kilometers that is um but yeah the giant mantas we see on the tags they'll move upwards of a thousand kilometers pretty quickly um but we haven't seen them passing that huge open ocean basin um but again like these are animals that we have not been extensively studying them for such a long period um at least in like the overall biological perspective and it's not like we've gone and tagged that many mantas at this point either so it could happen although we think it's unlikely um they're probably more doing a regional movement than the entire ocean basin hey uh, and i see a question from anna paula um Largest distance that's been covered, cited in different places for oceanic and reef manta. Um, 
So the longest distance in man to matcher. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I think for a giant, it would be around 300 kilometers probably. Um, that's the largest in man to matcher, just from photographic data. Um, for tagging data, like I said, we've seen much, much larger movements. So the photographic data, yeah, we're kind of restricted by where people are taking photos and who's comparing their photos to whose photos. Because, yeah, people aren't always comparing different data sets, which is something we're hoping to get man to matcher on a bit more, get more people collaborating. Um, for reef mantas, um, it's pretty close to the same. Um, it's, yeah, about 450 kilometers, although I'd actually have to check. So Project Manta in Australia, they are the ones who have recorded the longest um, migration of manta, of a reef manta, um, and it's a little bit shy of 600 kilometers. And actually that one probably is a manta matcher because they use manta matchers. So for reef manta, it would be um, nearly 600 kilometers. Great. I feel like um, I have this question for you, Anna, and then when you said the reef mantle migration, I was just like, wow, that's really annoying, and, like blew my mind, and then my question, you, you, I remembered it now, a lot of your photos, like if you guys looked up Anna on Instagram, it's like, do you work for National Geographic? Really, really great quality. But as a recreational diver, you know, sometimes you get so excited and you go to take this photo and the quality is not National Geographic level. So for Manta Matcher, how accurate can you be if your photos from the past are, should you even bother uploading them? Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, and this is actually one that I was thinking about saying, well, you can see, I mean, in my talk with the photos of Hornbill, like those old photos, um, and also my old photos are not super clear either. Um, we can take a wide variety of photos. Jess in her talk uh, last week, she demonstrated this quite nicely with some of the photos she had from Florida. And yeah, most of the photos I'm putting up on Instagram or in this presentation are the pretty edited photos. Um, but the vast majority of the database doesn't look that clean. Um, so we can take a wide variety. Um, with man to matcher, when we're using the algorithm for automated matching, it does require a fairly high photo quality um, because if you start to get a lot of backscatter or bubbles or little cleaner fish in the way or a diver's head or hand or like GoPro on a stick in the photo, um, then the algorithm starts to think that's part of the mantis spot pattern. So your matching gets a lot less accurate. If we don't get a match with the algorithm though, we will still visually match and I can match a lot of things by eye that the algorithm isn't able to do. Um, it's not the goal though. I mean, always they'll do it by eye, even though it just takes a lot longer. Um, but we would prefer to use the algorithm, especially because for this area, we've got over 600 mantas. So it takes me a long time to go through all of them and see if it's a new manta or a recite. And most of them are new. So I'm just constantly adding new mantas to it. So it's a pain, um, but it's actually something that Wild Me is really working on improving. Hopefully um, around June or July, uh, we're going to start integrating some new algorithms into the site, which will hopefully improve the matching capabilities. And we're also hoping to start using uh, machine learning to start figuring out, oh, that's a remora, that's not a spot pattern. Um, so once you get more photos of the same manta in there, it'll start to be a little bit smarter in how it matches them. So there's some exciting things in development. But yeah, right now I still spend a lot of time visual matching the lesser quality photos. And what I would say to any divers out there is if in doubt, send the photo in. I would much rather get a photo of a manta that I can't match um, than miss out on a possibly matchable photo. So yeah. And we've got a new question from Verna there. Yeah. Uh, she says, 
you know anything about mantas being influenced influenced by ocean sound pollution? Yeah, so um, yeah, sound pollution in the ocean is a big issue for a lot of animals. Um, mantas, I have never heard of it and I don't know anyone doing any research into it either um, just because we don't think that they use sound to communicate. Um, so it's just not been a big concern or priority for anyone just because we don't think that it's a problem for them. Um, there's actually, there were some interesting articles that came out a couple months ago because there was a similar question with whale sharks um, where a remote camera that was put on a whale shark's fin in the Galapagos a few years ago, it captured this weird sound, kind of like a dinosaur noise as all of our whale shark researchers said. Um, and everybody was confused because they're like, they don't have anything that should be able to make sounds and why would they make sounds? And it just like was this mystery. Um, and then they posted online, it turned out there was another person who had encountered a whale shark making a sound. So it's pretty uncommon, but they can apparently make this grumbly noise. Um, if you Google it, it'll come up somewhere online these days. It's now all been posted online. Um, and they think it's maybe something they do when they come in close proximity to other sharks, maybe a warning, because um, the one with the whale shark and the Galapagos, a little uh, silky shark, I think, came into the screen right when the noise came. So yeah, it's a possibility, but the thing is we don't have any evidence for mantas making noise or communicating that way. So noise pollution has not been a concern for researchers to date. be hard to study on a manta, right? Because like, at least with the whale shark, you have that nice big dorsal, you can put a camera on it, you can see where it's going and record the sound. With a manta, maybe an audio station on different dive sites where they frequent, but even then you would need to also be there to record how many mantas were there. Yeah, well, they have done these uh, remote recordings with mantas before. Um, the same kind of critter cams. The thing is, it's been more problematic than with the whale sharks. Because yeah, like you said, the whale sharks, they just clamp it onto the dorsal fin. And like with the, um, the white shark talk um, a few weeks ago, the pin dissolves and the thing pops off and floats to the surface. So they retrieve the camera. Um, with Miz, it's, yeah, they're, they do a suction cup on the top of the manta, which they've done successfully um, with whales before. But the thing with mantas is they've got, a lot of thick mucus on them so the cups just kept sliding off and they wouldn't stay um, and I've seen it with a couple of different people I know who've been trying to do this um, so it's been really difficult they've tried a lot of different things like there were some people using peanut butter to help stick the um, suction cup onto the manta for long enough. Yeah, apparently peanut butter worked the best. They like also tried dentures glue, like they used a whole bunch of different things. Um, also including like a little hook that hooked over the front of the manta's mouth so that it wouldn't just slide off the back, which is what they were usually doing. And then the hook just dissolved after a few hours. So there, there are ways of doing a similar critter cam for mantas. It's just more difficult because that body shape doesn't lend itself well to cameras staying on the manta. The picture you had of that really gnarly manta that was wrapped up in a lot of rope, um, when you see these types of things, are you and your team able to cut them free often? Because you always see these YouTube videos of like animals entangled interacting with divers to be free. And I only know of the tofu mantas who pretty much zoom past you at any chance possible. Yeah, so, yeah, tofu, Mozambique mantas, they are skittish. They are not, co most of the time, they're not very cooperative for stuff like that. Um, the mantas in Thailand are very, I mean, they're giants first off, so they're usually a bit more curious and confident than the reef mantas, um, but also just Mozambique mantas are special. Um, mm -hmm. Just, there's a lot more sharks out here, so they've got reason to be scared. Um, but yeah, so usually they'll let you. Unfortunately, in the case of that manta, um, she was really far above me and like way off in the distance. And it was like towards the end of the dive. And I like saw her and I like bolted out 
into the blue because I saw her like away from it was near Black Rock when it happened so I was like trying to get the ID and she kind of came towards me and I was like oh I'm gonna try and cut it off but first off that rope is huge and I don't know that my dive knife really would have been able to do much to it and second off I have a camera that requires two hands really um and <laughs> I I'm away from my buddy and like I had nowhere to throw my camera because I was oh, it's like once you get away from the rock out there like it drops down to 50 60 meters pretty quickly and I was not going to let my camera go and let it sink down there so I and, and she then like she kind of had a look at me and then she just like swam away so I couldn't catch up to her and ditch the camera and try and get it off and yeah I just I, the only thing I was thinking I was like I can try and grab it and like pull it over her cephalic fin and just slide it off the side like I don't think I would have been able to cut through it but sadly it was a very quick sighting I just managed to snap those two photos and then she was gone before I could even ditch my camera we've got a question I know you're talking about that you were in the dive industry and you saw these pictures of mantas and then it was love at first sight you decided you're gonna be manta forever or how can you remind us did you get involved from diver yeah. manta madness yeah so i did not go into so much detail with that so yeah so like i mentioned earlier um i used to work as a dive instructor so i finished a degree in biology then i went traveling became a dive instructor and started doing that and started while i was doing that getting really familiar with the reefs and the area and seeing how quickly things changed, um, especially there was a really bad bleaching incident um, in Thailand in 2010, um, and just seeing how quickly everything could change over that short period made me go, I really want to get more into conservation and start working a little bit more directly in that. And so I decided to go back to school. So I went back and did a master's degree in environmental management. Um, and then I knew I wanted to get back out um, into more developing areas. That's just the area I'm a little bit more interested in. And I wanted to do something more by the ocean was also my goal. Um, although I'd also worked on some terrestrial projects in grad school. So I actually had um, a short term placement in Tanzania with a big cat conservation group. Um, but it was only supposed to be for three months um, was the plan going in and so i was from the start kind of looking for other more long-term things and mmf had a volunteer research assistant position in mozambique where i had always wanted to go because i'd been hearing things for years and years about it i'd always been interested in mmf and the research um, that they were doing so i applied i got it um, and then yeah they kind of got stuck with me they kept giving me more things to do and I kept just sneaking in and staying for longer and taking on more different roles so I went from um yeah running a remote research station up in Basarudo to managing um the whole database down here in Tofu and getting to do these seasonal trips up to um Thailand and Myanmar um, to study those mantas as well so yeah, kind of a bit of luck and also, um, yeah, a lot of luck, but also like just having kind of the right sort of skill set and background. You'll see a lot of the people in this kind of research um, will usually be dive instructors or dive masters who also have a fairly extensive um, research um, background as well. Um, because yeah, you kind of need to be able to be a very confident diver to do a lot of this stuff as well. I get a lot of questions about, you know, how important is it to know how to dive in marine biology? Um, and it's a little bit like, well, marine biology is so massive. Like for what we're doing with marine megafauna, like on the research side, it's pretty important, I would say, to know how to dive. Yeah. Yeah, for our type of research specifically, but the thing is, it's actually, like, doesn't even need to be, um, even at MMF, like, not all of our researchers are divers um, on the whale shark side. Um, 
most of them are divers, but we did have one whale shark researcher here. We've had a few in and out who it's more about free diving. So it, they don't even need to be scuba divers for most parts of the world where they're researching them. So being a good free diver is more important. Um, yeah, same thing, Lucas, who runs our bull shark, he's starting a bull shark PhD here in Mozambique. Um, he's a much bigger free diver than a diver. Like he dives a bit, but he doesn't use the diving in his research at all. Like he wouldn't need to be a diver for his research. It's mostly free diving. Um, and there's plenty of research that can be done entirely from a boat. Like some of the stuff that we're doing for the reef monitoring um, on our conservation work here in Tofu, you don't need to be a diver at all. It's a bonus because we like getting some of our trying to get more of our Mozambican staff to be divers um, so they can come do some of this. It's a long process though because we usually have to teach them to swim first. So, Okay, seems to be winding down on our question portion. And well, let's see, I can't believe that you were talking about 2020 being like this epic year of how you do your first ever like exploratory dives in that section and then of course just like I love how you said 2020 happened because like here we are. Yeah I mean well I I'm lucky because yeah basically right before the Thailand season so I left the first week of March to head over there um, so my plan was to do a four-day trip then my eight-day expedition don't know why I can't say expedition today. Um, and then I was going to go out with another operator to do another eight day expedition after that one. Um, and I'm really lucky. And then I got there and I got the four day and the eight day trips in. And then coming back from that eight day trip, all of a sudden, like we'd been out of cell signal for six days and we come back in, we all look at our phones and we're like, what has happened with the world? And obviously my next trip was canceled. Um, and I was pretty lucky to get back to Mozambique before Thailand got completely locked down. Um, but yeah, Andrea didn't even come out. Like she was, her trip, she was on a different boat and the boat operator just canceled it like in February. And we were having discussions about like whether we needed to cancel my trips. And yeah, we made it work and I'm glad we got a little bit of data in before we had to leave, so. Yeah. It's like a movie scenario for you, like a remote boat, no cell phone service. You're having like super fun times diving and the rest of the world is, I like trying to do the great exit, I guess, as all the countries were saying yeah. home now. Well, you saw that, I mean, I feel like I'm glad I missed the whole slow ramp up to that, but I got like a mini version of the isolation that like some of those researchers on the research vessels like down in um, Antarctica are getting where they've been in the boat the last three months. And they're like, oh, we have to come back to the world now. It's like, so yeah, got the six day version. Well, then all that maybe is pushed to 2021 and you guys got big, big plans still in the works, just on hold. Yeah, so we have um, at least one expedition planned for 2021, and hopefully Andrea's canceled trip from this year will go in 2021. Um, so yeah, we're really hoping that we'll be able to. Um, we've also applied for some grants that would support a bit more exploration to different parts of the archipelago, and um, we also want to try some different research techniques um, up there if we get the funding for it, like trying to do some environmental DNA stuff. So yeah, lots of plans if we can do that, if it is allowed to happen. And then one more quick question for me. You take the samples, the biological samples, and you're in Thailand. Are, you, are we transferring that? Is that difficult? Well, um, so we have a plan. We haven't had to do this yet. So yes, yeah, so we don't have permits to do the tagging and sampling in Thailand. We have it for Myanmar. Um, we're working on getting to that point in Thailand, but um, they, they've had some issues with tagging there in the past. People have objected to do, do gong tagging. So when we asked to do it with mantas, they just said no straight away, just because there's been like a bad public reaction to it. Um, but um, FFI and Myanmar has been really great in getting us all the right permissions and so we're really working on collaborating with them to do more shark and ray research in that area. 
So what we would do is the boat, um, we go to Myanmar and we pick up the FFI researchers there. We head out, we go diving in Myanmar for a few days, head back, we have to cross the border back. So we drop off the guys <clears throat> from FFI at the border. So never cross the border. So what we would do is if we got any samples, which as I said, we just don't have mantis showing up right now when I'm trying to train the guys on how to do this, unfortunately. So the last two seasons when we've been trying to do it, because it's wildlife, we haven't been able to. But the plan is um, the samples would go back to Myanmar and they would stay in a fridge there with either um, Tanda, who's our MMF research assistant um, over in Myanmar, or with FFI. Um, until we get a couple of them um, so we can organize all the export permits and then they would be sent to a lab for analysis um, probably in Australia maybe in the US depending on where we had someone doing those analyses at that point in time but yeah we would just build up a sort of set of samples over how much time it took to get that depending on sightings and so they would just stay in Myanmar until they'd go somewhere else for analysis Lots of steps. Lots of logistics for all of this. Yeah, there's a lot of paperwork and figuring out various bureaucracies. Um, yeah. But worth it, because the more we know, the better we'll be able to do like international protections. Yes, that's the goal. Super. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Anna, for giving us your time. And thanks, everybody, for showing up and listening to this talk. And stay safe. We're still in the middle of COVID. Um, stay safe in Mozambique and wherever you are in the world. <laughs> and, Thanks. Yep. Yeah, I'll just close out. Everybody says, thank you. Great talk. Super. Thanks for organizing, Janae. Yeah. All right. I'll see y'all. Bye. Bye.